Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe and I am the host and producer of the Fireside Chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I am in Fort Lauderdale, Florida at the iconic Ramrod Bar, and my guests are community activists, Devin McLaughlin and Bruce Marcus. Say hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hey, Bruce. All right. First thing I'd like to know, and what I think the audience would love to know about both of you, is tell us a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your world here. Go ahead. <laughs> Ready? Um, ten years ago, he got an early retirement package and joined me out of Hell's Kitchen. That's, that's how we ended up in Fort Lauderdale. Um, but, you know, for me, I've been involved in the leather community since probably the mid-90s. I was on the South Market Bear Chess calendar in San Francisco for a couple of years, which was um, a benefit for the AIDS Emergency Fund. Um, you know, so we were out raising money, raising awareness, doing things. Any reason for me to take my clothes off in public? It's a joke. You know, it's like, oh, calendar here. I'm so shy. Um, so I've moved all over the country, and we met in Manhattan um, 15 years ago. Yeah. What took you to San Francisco? Um, I grew up on an 800-acre cattle farm in Iowa and turned 18 and ran. <laughs> <laughs> but why there as opposed but, to anywhere else? Um, boyfriend I had at the time wanted to go. I wanted to go to New York. He wanted to go to San Francisco. He was born in San Francisco. Um, we left the Midwest. Two, two cats, us, 17-foot U-Haul, go west to America. Wow. Um, no jobs, no apartment, no nothing. Just took all our money out of the bank and went to San Francisco. And, um, when I broke up, Bob and I broke up. We've been together for five, five and a half years. Within four months, I had my nipple pierced, chaps, and a motorcycle. So, hit the ground running. Take me back to your motivations for uh, settling in San Francisco. How did you know about anything going on there? Um, when we first got there, I didn't. You know, it was wide-eyed and first morning we got there, we got straight through from Reno, and my partner at the time was calling his mom, and we were on a payphone right on Castro on like 19, and he went up against, he's talking to his mom, and there's this guy in a bay window up above, across the street, doing a, like, <laughs> come on up, and I'm like, Bob, 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 um, that was my, <laughs> that was my introduction to kink and things in San Francisco, um, you know, but mostly just um, got to know a few people, was curious, was a little scared. Um, you know, being in your early 20s and not sure what's going on. And, um, eventually found found my people. Tell us a little bit about that. What was the leather scene that you encountered when you got there? Oh my god, it was, it was amazing. It was like my first big outing was the Mr. San Francisco Leather Contest. Oh, wow. So I pull up in my new chaps and on my motorcycle and meet my friend, Charlie, and sat there and was just like, oh my god, this is where I belong. This is, you know, this is where I fit in. This is, this is, you know, lots of hot, sexy, and new leather, and I want to be part of it. It was a tumultuous time, though, in the 90s, wasn't it? Tell us a little bit about how the community was evolving and changing. Um, you know, there was a lot, it was, it was a tumultuous time, like you said, the calendar was a, a benefit for the AIDS Emergency Fund, there was a lot of HIV AIDS issues going on, and, but there was still that, that sort of sexual energy and tension within the leather community, you know, and SM, sex, you know, this is how we express ourselves is, you know, through BDSM um, sexually, but it doesn't have to be about penetration. So it was a way to connect with other people without having to worry about, you know, if that happened, great. If not, you know, there were things, other things to do. So in Iowa, you had no concept on any of this? No. Wow. No. I just, you know, dove into the deep end of the pool and decided to, you know, this is where I belonged. Tell 
us about your experiences, Bruce. So I've been an activist in various communities for as long as I can remember. Grew up in the East Coast, but moved to California at one point. I uh, helped organize the first gay pride march in San Diego in the early 70s. I helped organize against the Bricks Initiative in Los Angeles a couple of years later. We were leading a big contingent of activists into the LA Pride Parade, which at that time was a bunch of bar floats, and they didn't want people arguing about anything. So we forced our way in with several hundred people at the place. So I think the audience would probably want to know about the Briggs Initiative. I, I don't know that a lot of people would remember that. So Briggs was this reactionary state senator, state senator, I think, in California, who introduced an initiative that would prevent bar homosexuals from teaching in the public schools. And uh, he had a lot of support. And, uh, Big areas of California were then, and some of them still remain, quite conservative. And it was a huge fight. And, and the, the buck, in our community, the fight broke down to, are we going to have stars speak on our behalf on TV, or are we going to have masses of people in the street doing something about it? And we, you know, that's what we did. We had masses of people in the street doing things about the initiative. And we succeeded in defeating it. It was one of the first big victories for me right to that country. That was depicted in the movie Milk. What were your thoughts on seeing it depicted in a Hollywood film? Um, you know, I thought that the film softened all the edges, as, as film often does, right? Um, you know, activists tend to be quirky. I mean, no one becomes an activist to is satisfied with the status quo. So they tend to be quirky in lots of ways. Getting them all to work together is often a huge challenge because everyone's got an agenda going off it. But this was something people came up together around. Um, and it, it was a real grassroots effort. And a great one of the proudest things I did have done. And after that, I moved to New York, um, and, which was a much more established community. Um, loving community in Los Angeles was mostly a couple of parties and a couple of bike clubs, and one or two bars. Larry's, the quintessential London bar, which was right across the street from Paramount Studio. Oh, well. Yeah. And then the, that thing on the Lucy and Ricky, they showed a view from, going out from the studio, and there was the, where the bar used to be. So, oh. it was down there. Uh, anyway, and in, in uh, New York, got involved with the leather community, that leather asset community, through an organization called GMSMA, Game of SM Activists. Yes. And through them, we have to organize big numbers of SM leather package people nationally <coughs> for the two marches on Washington, uh, 87 and 93, and for Summer 94. Those were big, big events, which helped bring the community way out in the open and made it much more comfortable. Tell us more about that. Tell the audience a lot more about GMSMA because I don't know that a lot of people are familiar. So this was a, not a sex club. This was an organization based around uh, social, education, and political. Frankly, it was formed by a number of people who had difficulty meeting people in bars, and they wanted a non-sexual environment in which to get to know other people like them. Um, anybody could join, any male could join. Uh, whether we didn't define what that was. We had some women who were special invitees to be members like Hank and Olivia and Olivia and all those um, uh, was right. But at its high point, GMSMA would get two to three hundred people every other week to a meeting at the community center in New York. It was the biggest event of the community center. Uh, part of how we got legitimacy was by helping to pay for the community center. So at one point, we bought all the folding chairs and put our logo on the back of it. So anyone going to any event at Center, had to see the GMSMA level on it. So there's a way. Because originally the community center didn't want us there. Because those were the days in which leather was not something socially acceptable. Even in the bike clubs, kinky people were not socially acceptable. Oh, wow. And uh, so that little GMSMA was part of not hiding who we are. It was right out there in the name. It wasn't any, you know, funny little abbreviation of what it should be. Gay male SM activists. And that's what we it. Anyway, we got several hundred people to meetings regularly. We ran workshops. We ran classes. And, and we would run between three and six hundred members every year. So, of course, in the AIDS epidemic, along with the internet, which killed off anybody's desire to go to events. Tell us a little more about the growth of the organization. Tell us more how it impacted the community. Well, it provided a place for people who knew they were didn't quite fit in somewhere else to fit in here. And, and what I was keenly interested in is for many of our members, this was their entree into the gay community. They had no connection with it. In those days, we were still struggling around sodomy being illegal, around the right to marriage, discrimination of all kinds. 
I remember distinctly when one of the New York Mr. Leathers got fired from his job because his bank sold him uh, on some video pants with Mr. Leather. You could do that then. And, and so getting these people out to become, to see themselves as needing to struggle for their right to be who they are was why we did the 87 March in Washington and 94 and 93 and 94. And it made a huge difference. So we had, for, for Stonewall 25 in New York, we had a couple of thousand people at an SMO finished conference the last two days around the world. So, wow. Not the late 70s were an amazing time in New York City, or at least the time of legend. Tell us some of the things you've <laughs> experienced then, the bars you visited. So, 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 of course, legends always have this halo of the past. Okay. Again, smooth off all the rough edges. It was an exciting place to be, uh, but it was a very, in many ways, very repressed place to be. People were not. Some people were comfortable walking around in London in the daytime, but I had lots of friends who lived in fancy buildings on the east side or west side, and they would put on a long overcoat to come out of their building in London because they didn't want their doorman to see them. We were out to try to change that sense of who you could be if you were. And, and, and I'd never forget this. One of our crowning accomplishments was the day of Stonewall 25, the New York Times ran an editorial, and one of the things they said in that is, this is fighting for society where people can be wherever they are, even if they dress in leather. We don't mention the times that way. And so that to me was we, we broke it through. And it made it a lot easier for people. Now this was not without controversy here. There were big parts of our community who preferred being on the wrong side of the tracks in the dark and thought that the light would destroy the mystique and, 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 and dark energy, if you will. Which I had not found that to me at all. I had been out in the light all of my life. Never stopped that the kind of sex I would have. Tell us about some of the bars, though. I mean, the mine shaft and, and the mine shaft wasn't and... a bar. Mine shaft was a club. Oh, okay. Which um, uh, Wally Wallace ran, but it was actually in front of a company for a couple of New York cops and the mob was the main company. Oh, so, my. And, and the mine shaft crowd was mostly bridge and tunnel people. It was people who come over from oh. New Jersey or from out on the island to, you know, to do the stuff they couldn't do at home. There were oh, some locals there. But it was. Uh, more sleaze than, than than anything else. The bathtub was a popular place. And not so much hardcore SM. You couldn't see first of all. The lighting was like being inside a dark cave, and so it doesn't really we went to have kinky sex. There were um, there were a couple of clubs that were kind of, the big bars at the time. Were when I first moved there, there was a Keller still open down at the foot of Christmas Street, which was very cool. But then up the up uh, the West Side Highway, the Grand Rod, and then farther up were the Spike and the Eagle. For a long time, the Spike and the Eagle were the two dominant bars. They were a short New York City block apart, so you could go back and forth. They got priced out by real estate development. Sure. The of New York. Sure. They were fun places, and they were very social places, too. Because you could, you could, I could go on a Saturday, Sunday, Thursday, Friday, whatever night, and run into a lot of people I knew from GMSMA. So it was a social place as well as a place to I met my second woman, Karen Berger, partner at this one. Let's take a step back, though. Bring us back to your introduction to the Leather King community. Well, I'd done King for a long time before I got to New York. So in L.A., I was hanging out in the King bars. You know, I was uh, 20-something. And in San Diego, there was one leather bar. And I you know, sit on top of a bar stool near the, uh, the uh, jukebox and get out of there in 20 minutes and I had stayed. And, and it went to the bars a lot in L.A. as well. And uh, there was a, you know, there were better pride events in L.A., but small, uh, much more, much more visible. And there was no organization like GMSMA in L.A. or with Avatar, which was uh, you know, or, or you know, members play. Yes. GMSMA didn't play. We didn't do that. But we wanted to be open to everyone. So I came to New York, started hanging out at the, at the Spike or the Eagle. I found out about GMSMA and started going to their meetings. That was before the community center existed, so they were meeting, and somebody had a, an import-export business, and there was a large area in the back that we could use for meetings. So we had meetings there, small, 20, 25 people. When we moved to the center happen, it enabled us to publicize this broadly, which we did. So mailings and flyers and little bars, and that's where we started to get some of the people. Uh, the bars continued to be really big and popular until Say until HIV took its fall. Really, the combination of HIV, 
redevelopment, the meeting up online is supposed to go to Florida, so we're going to And then there was the lore for a while, and then we're back to the Eagle in a different location, but it's never gone back to the way There are going to be hundreds of people. Yeah, of course. You were both involved with GMS and so tell us what became of that organization. How did it develop? What happened to it? Start. Well, it grew very rapidly, so there was a lot of interest in this. Just, don't forget, in this period, some in there is where Madonna began wearing PP outfits, and so it became more socially acceptable. You could see more people on the street wearing leather, so people were comfortable coming out in the light, out of the center, wearing their leather, like the meeting about. And Jimmy Smith did meetings on technical uh, things, you know, how to do uh, the tits, or fisting, or, and then lifestyle things. What does it mean to be a member of the Community, um, breath play, all kinds of things. It always to be, uh, um, started Folsom Street East, um, which was a big fundraising event. Worked on work with others to form Leather Pride Night, which for a long time was a very big event. But first of all, the leadership of all these organizations, the men, got to be very hard by the change. Yeah. And it's hard to develop leadership. I mean, you don't have people like that. It's hard to find people who want to put the work in. I mean, it was a period in New York. Somebody I knew on a first name, chat to basis, was dying every week. And so it dramatically affected all, all of that public health. People began to focus on taking care of their health and their, their companions' health, their lovers' health, as opposed to doing anything. How, how did it uh, finally wind down, come to an end? That was <laughs> your yeah. That yeah. was my doing, so to speak. Um, so Bruce had, Bruce had been chairman and president and stuff for, for several years, and I started getting involved, and they were coming up for elections, and I got elected to the board, and it was like one of those cartoons where they're like, whoever wants to volunteer, step forward, and everybody steps back. Um, uh, stop, you know, so I'm standing there, so I ended up being president, um, the last bit of GMSMA. Um, again, very active, you know, Folsom Street East with that project, you know, as part of GMSMA. Um, but the year that year that I took over, I had, it was really hard to get people to volunteer into a leadership position. When was this? I mean, I think, you know, it ended because we won. We, we, we accomplished what it set out to do, which uh, made it much more possible for people to be themselves. In the, in the, the other people were not, whatever you want to call them, were not welcome in the border gay community for a long time. There were huge arguments about the Free March and the Pride Parade. But we embarrassed some of these things. And on, on, also, in that period of time is when we sort of invented, so it used to be the other people. That was the and then there were SMP. And when we were trying to figure out how to broaden this for the marches on Washington, we came up with the so again, SM Leather Fetish King community. So that everybody could be involved and we'd have more people. Yes. And so that's what it sort of became. But that was an accomplishment of those days in Jesus. Um so I ended up with six people on the board that year and by January I had three months. Wow. And um you know, people calling and saying, I can call in for board meetings, I can do it. I'm like, no, this is an active board. I need butts and seats to be able to do the projects and the workshops and the things. So, um, running up against, again, all these issues, again, internet, people, meeting, doing other avenues of information. Um, we declared, declared victory in close to the organization. <laughs> we accomplished what we set out to do, and and sort of pulled the plug. What were your feelings on that? Um, frustrated, sad. Um, in some ways excited because we've come so far. Um, you know, here we are at you know, 11 o'clock in the morning out in leather, walking around in the street, and nobody, nobody, nobody bats an eye, right? So, from that perspective, where you know, we accomplished what we needed to do. 
was there disappointment that you couldn't have taken the organization in a different direction and done something more, done something different? There was there was a group that wanted to turn it into a play organization, which was never the intent. Um, so there was you know some people that broke off and started their own thing. Um, you know, a lot of it a lot of it just seemed to be um, once you get to a certain level, everything was sort of you know, phase. You also have to look at it in the context of what was happening in the broader communities. So the gay rights movement sort of hit its peak in Stonewall 25. Yes. There have been a, a huge mass national march. Doesn't mean the issues haven't gone away, but the urgency to do that seems to have faded. The women's movement, the abortion rights movement, all of those sort of hit that same downturn at that point. And I don't think the gay rights movement can, can have a resurgence without those having a resurgence. Okay. So you saw it as sort of a, a larger circle of events and things that were all going on at the yeah. same time. In context. Uh, yeah. yeah. The gay rights movement has always been heavily dependent on the women's movement for inspiration and for energy. Any of the iconic events? You mentioned uh, marches on Washington. Tell us more about that. Uh, it's really exciting. So, uh, we're going to, after the Supreme Court waffled on yeah, but it was some gay rights issue. Uh, folks in New York decided to maybe it's time to have a march in Washington. There had been one right before the Bowers decision in 1879. Please tell the audience about that. Seven, I can't remember that. I went to that one as a participant. It was not that big. But by eight, by, by 86, it was clear there needed to be something done. It was, you know, gay rights were under attack. I heard that there were going to be a meeting in New York to form a committee to all of March Washington. And it was typical movement stuff, you know. The first night was spent with independent singers going on endlessly about I don't know what. And I said to my friends at GMSMA, if we go in a larger group, we can probably win a vote to include both leather people, drags, and trans people in this event, but it's going to be a fight. We want to make that fight. And they did. And we did. And we found allies among definitely community. We went to the meeting and actually we actually forced it to a floor vote where the wow. conservative members of the community voted against our community. But we won by maybe five or six percent difference. And we got as a consequence a seat on the steering committee. Okay. So we were part of actually running the march. We decided that if we're going to do that we're going to contingent, we should have an event as well. So we rented this auditorium on Constitution Avenue I think it is directly across from the Smithsonian. It's the Department of Commerce Department Auditorium, and we took it up on a huge banner out front of it and some leather fetish community conference. And at that point, we had maybe a thousand people at the event, but enough to you know begin to go forward and try to organize it. What do you think really that that accomplished with the marches on Washington? It gives people confidence. First of all, it does have a political impact, right? With politicians, no matter how reactionary they are, see hundreds of thousands of people in the street. They, they change their their position. They may have changed their minds, but they bend to it. You know, it's just like the, the civil rights movement. These people didn't stop becoming racist when they passed the Civil Rights Act. They just realized they had an alternative here. But it's the same thing with the gay rights movement. You know, people out in the street, politicians will listen to them. And so it changed that. It changed the, it, it's enormously invigorating, fortifying the confidence of people involved in it. I can do something. I'm not this helpless guy in my apartment by myself. I have brothers and sisters, I have allies, together we can do something. I am empowered. You know, sexuality in this country, in this society, is so repressed. And yeah. It empowers people about claiming their sexuality is a good thing. I can't help but wonder, you both work in two of the most iconic cities that dealt with gay worlds. What differences can you see now between San Francisco and New York? Um, you know, for me, San Francisco was, um, obviously it's California, so it's much more laid back. It's, it's easier going. It's not as, um, the right word is, it's, it's not as, I'm going to say, it's cohesive, but it's a different kind of cohesive than New York City is. Okay. Um, 
you know, there were there were events and there were bars and there were things, but in New York it was like you had this and you had specifics, you had the eagle, you had the spike, you had whatever, where, you know, when I lived in, in San Francisco, there was, you know, you'd do the circle of bars, but there wasn't like a all, you know, encompassing, let's all get together and do something kind of situation. Okay, there wasn't New York. New York has always been this country's scrappy part of driving change. Always. All of the all of the movements, all of the organization, New York has always been in this country where it happens, which is why so many reactionaries hate New York so much. Uh, uh, that's a good point. That was a lovely place to live and great people out there, but it's much more it's laid back. And and the Levitt community there was much more conservative than the Levitt community. How so? There were large portions of that really like the wrong side of the track, your outlaws. So part of organizing for the marchers in Washington, not only did we invent the notion of the S and the British community, we also were, were recreated, and I wasn't there with Red and the Blackboard, safe, sane, consensual. Yes. And so the response from the people out west who didn't like being in the public was unsafe, insane, non consensual is their counter. Uh, okay. It's always a struggle. And, the, and there was a horrible incident we tried, after between the two marchers on Washington, we tried to build a national coalition of groups. Because at that point, there were many groups like GMSA, most of them much, much smaller. And we had this meeting in Dallas, which was a disaster, where Californians came with proxies for dozens of groups no one ever heard of, voted to essentially not do anything, elected a steering committee for this organization they created with nobody east of the Mississippi River. So, yeah. What organization did they try to create? Uh, Beyond leather. I think I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. I think. Okay. But national, what was it, the national? Oh, no, Beyond uh, Vanilla. Sorry, Beyond Vanilla. Oh, okay. Beyond Vanilla. I think Beyond Leather is the name of an event. Yeah, yeah. That, Beyond yeah, Vanilla right was the name. Okay. We thought that was funny. They were not even brave enough to include leather or SM in the name of what they were It's fascinating. Yeah. In a strange way. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's sad. National Leather Association. Talk with us a little bit about that. So I knew Steve Madoff, the founder of it, and I like him quite well. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a nice guy, and we worked both together. And uh, at, at a certain point, the folks who were opposed to the more visible public outreach of GMS and they coalesced around the NLA. And uh, tried to convince everyone to join the NLA as opposed to staying in their local. So we had a big, powerful local organization, so no reason to give that up. So they had their conferences. We'd go to their conferences. I think they still exist in the Pacific Northwest, maybe. But they never had, they never did much of anything other than holding really conference. You've both mentioned Folsom East in New York City. Talk with us about that. What is that? Um, Folsom Street East is a once a year street fair that happens uh, well, when I was doing it, I think it's moved, but it was happening on 28th Street in front of the Eagle, now I think they've moved it over a block or two. Um, so it's Folsom Street East became the event that made the organization. So GMSA may, GMSMA started Folsom Street East, okay, and Folsom Street East grew and grew and grew. And so I was the president of uh, Folsom Street East after after GMSMA closed down. I was the president of uh, Folsom Street East for like five years. Okay. So um, from the time I started working on it, you know, even before I was running it, I worked on it for a couple of years and, and fought to get things like a real stage versus the back of the flatbed truck. So yeah. we always did things on the cheap and cheap. Yeah. <laughs> our, our production costs for an event were as close to zero as you could get. Oh, so wow. We, all of our, we, we did a fundraising event. All of the money went to the, the beneficiaries. Okay. No, but, um, that eventually sort of changed. The, the philosophy was that we don't take ourselves seriously as you know this big event. Nobody else is going to take us seriously. Mm -hmm. So getting a real stage, getting people that uh, to perform that... Like Sylvia Tosin, she was is an amazing dance performer, producer. Um, you know, she's Billboard Top Ten back in the day, 
And she was this amazing woman that would just give of her time and her talent and um, helped us, you know, get some more credibility within some of that music world stuff. Um, Crystal Waters had a protege that <laughs> I get a phone call one day and it's like, it's Crystal Waters in my phone. Um, asking if her, her protege guy could perform at Full Sister Days. I'm like, hell yeah. You know, so it's not just drag queens, I mean, not going to say just, but it's not, you know, the only thing there wasn't drag queens and do things. And we, you know, instituted um, an annual event called the, the, our, our Full Sister Pipe Meeting Contest. Oh my. Which basically got teams of people and Bottoms were in jock straps, bent over hay bales, and smashed pie into their ass. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever cleaned their plate first won the contest. I mean, so, you know, obviously we don't get cherry or chocolate cream, but, you know, a good, a good whipped cream pie. Um, so that's the kind of stuff, you know, to try to take it to something sort of out there and kind of raunchy and still fun. Um, it was, it was, was always that there were fewer and fewer districts in New York where an event like that would be accepted. You get, they'd get into all these fancy condos all around. Yeah, um, yeah. And then the High Line opened over 28th Street when we were doing it one year. Oh, wow. And, you know, people were like, what about the children? I'm like, bitch, we've been here for fucking 16 years. Oh, God. You know, um, that's kind of crazy that, that gets me. And of course, then you get the people that are like, well, in San Francisco, you can go naked. I'm like, well, that's San Francisco. That's not here. So it's very pretty, but you have to put it back in your pants. What do you two think was the greatest challenge that the New York City scene faced? And maybe still faces. Well, the greatest it's challenge is HIV. Okay. It's decimated. All, all parts of it. Yeah. Um, after that, the greatest challenge is today, I think, is getting back the notion of a community which is not just raising money for some politician. An independent activity. But that, that's a national problem. Right? We, all, all of our efforts seem now to be electing people who like us as opposed to pressuring the people whether they like us or not. Okay. That is a shift. Yes. How did you see HIV and AIDS impact the scene? Well, I bury three long-term partners. Oh, my gosh. So... I said, I said, they want to create a plan with every week. <coughs> it, you know, just destroyed all the institutions. It destroyed. At one point, almost every single person, for example, who did window dressing at the major stores in New York. All from Broadway, chorus boys, principals, leather community, every part of society. And it, and it sort of feels to me like the world is experiencing writ large, what we experienced with COVID, what we experienced back then, everybody is a thing. That's a very strong correlation. Yeah. Now, what brought you to... Let, no, I'm going to back up one <laughs> step. Back up one step. There we go. You met on Recon. We met on Recon. Tell us about that. It was a hookup. It was a hookup. I had moved to... I had moved to New York... On the 1st of January, 2000, uh, I don't remember, whatever, 2006, okay. 16 years ago, 16 years ago, okay. yeah, and left an ex, put, you know, two suitcases and a blow-up bed and go, you know, start your life over, and I ended up in this illegal loft, so it was an industrial building where somebody had taken the second floor and turned it into ten bedrooms, two bathrooms, a kitchen, a living room, and only, only rented to gay men. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, wow. Found it on Craigslist. It, was, it got me into Manhattan without having to spend $26,000 to try to get an apartment. You know, the first, last security broker. Mm -hmm. All that. All that crazy. Um, but why the move to New York? I'd always wanted to be in New York. Okay. Um, my background in real life is menswear. So I had um, a career designing, doing design and development for menswear. Um, I worked for you know, big companies like Nike and designed stuff for Liz Claiborne and um, I thought and my last job in New York was working for Banana Republic on the 
my scene life. So this is where I always wanted to be. I always felt like I belonged in New York even before I got to New York. Okay. I, I have sort of this larger than life, semi aggressive personality, <laughs> shall we say? So it's New York. Very it's well. New York really uh, well. I'm really good at excuse me, push. You know, with the, tur- <laughs> the tourists on the street. Um, that's where I always wanted to be, and that's where it's, it, uh, you know, it just felt like home. It felt like where it belonged. So, meeting on Recon, how did that come along? <laughs> you don't really hear a bunch about people. And then meeting on he came over. So well, I, I saw him online, and I we got started questions online, and you know, I did a chat back and forth. Okay. So today, I'm, I'm not very shy about making days in the boy. Okay. Anyway, did the AOL thing before there was Yeah, I was comfortable doing that. So he came over, I tied him up to my bed in the radiator, and basically beat his nuts until he blew his load, and he started chasing me. Oh my goodness. There we have it. There we have it. Yes. <laughs> and you've been together, did you mention 16 years? Is that what I understood? Yeah. Um, 18 and a half. Okay. April, April will be 16. Yeah. Why the move to South Florida? Uh, I was working for a big, I was a senior executive at a big corporation. We were undergoing some changes. We had a sort of difference in thinking about how to carry out those changes. I was not willing to compromise what I thought were my ethics and principles. So we parted ways and it gave me no way. So I, I was retired early, about six months before my real retirement age. I was retired. And I didn't want to stay in New York. I wanted to be somewhere to be outside more. New York is a great place to be if you're working and busy every day, but I don't think it would be a great, an active, great place to retire. With the options, Fire Island, Manhattan, we, we'd already, oh, I already had, had a condo down here for many, many years. Oh, I see. So we knew the area. So let's go to the area, knew some people, knew the way of the land. It was comfortable, it was easy to get around. How have you found the scene here? Tell us a little bit about the South Florida that we've seen. Challenging. Also, um, you know, for me it was hard coming down here and sort of, I knew where I belonged in New York. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew what my role was, I knew what I was doing, and I come down here and I, and I felt lost. Interesting. Um, there's not a lot of community activity. There's not a lot of community activity. I mean, there's, there was only, only this bar and Leatherworks. Okay. And... I had done some volunteering with the Lambda Men's Brotherhood that puts on the Leather Mass Ball every year, which is now in conjunction with Pig Week. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and, you know, tried to, tried to help with that for a couple of years. And, and again, we had some, some challenges. For me, this is one of those, for being such a small pond, there's a whole lot of attitude. Interesting. Okay. That's just maybe my perception of it. But this place is very dominated by the visitors, whether they're for the winter or just for a week. And what I've discovered is that people who may be kinky where they live come down here, down here, and they want to be by the pool, by the ocean, be drinking. Not interested in kinky things. So, there is in New York, we have lots York, of visitors, lots of international and people around the country. We can entertain. You know, um, here, very few. Fascinating. Do you think that it is, or rather, let me rephrase that, is it something you think could be built up a little more, or something that you think you can somehow affect? We'll come here to retire. Not, not to build new things, many of them, but to retire. Interesting. I mean, I think there's always an opportunity to do more outreach and do more connecting um, across levels. Um, you know, for, for a while, there. I was helping organize during the Wilton Manor Gay Pride event, um, South Florida Leather Coalition. Yes, tell us more about that. That was just a float. <laughs> <laughs> this is a float and a parade, but it was the name we came up with. But it got the gay men, the lesbians, the pansexuals, the whoever didn't fit into the umbrella of something else. Okay. And I think what three years? We did that and rented a float and got everybody out in full leather or rubber or do whatever and made our statement that we're here. And, and that 
the intersexual groups tried to do another Pride Night down here. It didn't go anywhere. One or two events. Mike Walden actually spoke in one. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the gay men didn't show up for that. Very interesting. Interesting. Now, do you feel that uh, there's some way for you to connect with people that would give you a more stronger community sense? You know, we come here, meet people sometimes. I have to tell you, though, that you know, I used to pick up people regularly in bars in New York. I've never you know, picked up or been picked up by anybody. Never. I don't know. Uh, I, I, it's being difficult. I think, again, you still got the factors of... Well, you got a couple of things going. you got the internet, right, where people meet. Also, we have younger friends now that we've made through our longer-term friends. And they hang out <laughs> all kinds of like they're, they're as likely to go to, to, to Mona's or Monkey Bar or one of the street bars as they are to come here. They don't feel that same need. Mm. And, and what would that need be? I mean, to, uh, just, to be around people exactly like that. Oh, okay. They're more comfortable around a more diverse group of people. Okay. So you're basically depicting somewhat of a, an overall shift in yeah. social Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty true question. Now, and I think that here is probably one of the last places that there's a defined gay enclave like both of them. In both cities, there's a broken, I mean, there, there isn't anything like that in New York anymore. No. Both cities, I don't know what's happened to Boys Town and Chicago. It's not like this yeah. either. Yeah. yeah, so this is the last, kind of last place for it. And you can argue whether it's good or bad that we're now more integrated into. But what, what have you to say then about Palm Springs in that case? Small, it's small and relatively isolated. A lot of population comes there for this, and right? And the, the number of people who hang out there all year round is relatively limited because that's how brutal it is. But that could be, a, you know, one of the remaining. I mean, there's a little bit of it here, there's a little bit of it in Cape Cod. But in almost every city, there used to be a more defined neighborhood where people live. And that's broken down a lot. In part because there's opportunities to lots of places. You know, yeah. So feel, you know, feel the need. I mean, there were times in San Francisco and New York where you could. Spend your day at only gay, so the only gay kinky establishments. Mm -hmm. Not just bars, but restaurants, and coffee shops, bookstores. Yeah. yeah. Now, somewhere, someday, someone is going to watch this video. <laughs> and they're going to say, I want to go live in Fort Lauderdale. What have you to say to them? I love it. I think it be outside 330 days a year. I love the pool. I love skinny dipping in my pool. <laughs> I love the casualness of living here. I, mean, I love that I can be whoever I want here. One of the nice things about living in Broward County in general is almost anywhere we go, we see other gay people. And that's a good thing. What challenges do you uh, have living here as opposed to other big cities? <laughs> Restaurants, uh, culture. Uh, so, no, so, like, when we lived in New York, I mean, there, there's a bazillion amazing restaurants in New York that you, and you can get anything you wanted to deliver. You know, you can get ice cream sundaes from the, you know, ice cream shop around the corner and deliver. Where here, my biggest, my biggest challenge was, um, like I said, it is very, very, like, uh, it's very casual. It is the sense of urgency is practically non existent. Okay. Um, so, for some people, that's great. It took me a year to stop being pissed off. I wasn't living in the town anymore. Huh. Um, until like it was one February something, and I'm laying naked in the pool, and there's clouds going by, and the palm trees, and I was like, okay, dude, get the fuck off this. <laughs> You know, but with some research and some trial and error, we found some, some nice restaurants that we, that we do like. We subscribe, you know, to a couple of, of things that come through Broadway Across America and just through that SME series um, that happen. So if you spend the time and look for it, you can find it. You know, we still go back to New York for theater trips. Um, and it's, it's much, obviously, much different now than when we live there. Um, we're living in a tourist market, right? And so restaurants do a lot of their business for tourists. And so they don't really care what your food or service is like. So you're not coming back. You're there for a one shot. And so it's not like they're trying to cultivate a lot of locals here. So anything that tourists 
patron makes here, the, the standards are usually not very high because they know it's not the to be business. But if someone were moving here and they want to get involved in your local leather scene, what advice can you offer someone like that? Well, first of all, define for me what the local leather scene is. That's for you to tell if us. the scene is <laughs> this bar and that bar down there, and, you know, you go to those bars and they all have events. And tonight is, is big dance here. Yes. A lot of people here. Yeah. Force dress code back here one one night third Sunday of the month. It's legal has all kinds of parties. You go to those things. You force dress, dress code in August though. It's uh, kind of a yeah. challenge. Yeah. But community beyond bars and a lot of the community centers around Ladder Works, they have some events there. They have classes. They have classes. But there's not much community. There are a few organizations. Yeah. Onyx is here. And it's ours. It's ours. They get to the hotel. And there are contests, and so there's that kind of stuff that goes on. But if you want to be in a fire where you meet people socially, not necessarily sexually competitive, there aren't a lot of other hmm. Okay. I, I can't help but then beg the question, why do you say? Because it's warm. Because we have days like today. In New York, it was, what, what 12 degrees today or whatever, yeah. and there's snow on the ground. And here it's 76, going up to 80. We can be in the pool this year. We found our own niche. Okay. You know, we found out what works for us. I mean, we have our playroom at home, and we spend a lot of time, you know, enjoying that. Um, so don't need a whole lot of outside, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so to speak. Um, and we find people that we like, and they can take it they can back. They come back repeatedly over and over. And it's staying with us right now. Okay. Yeah. You know, how do you two want to be remembered? By the community. Um, you know, I think one of my biggest accomplishments, the community deals with Folsom Street East and got it into a legitimate 501c3 status, where before it was all sort of being run under the table. Got it. And, you know, yes, money was being donated to the center and um, NCSF, National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. Yeah, I told you, I forget what I was on board about for two years, too. Please tell the audience a little bit about that. <laughs> I forgot National about Coalition of National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. Yeah. Um, it's basically an organization that fights for your right to express yourself sexually however you want to. Okay. Um, I went out um, while on the board, and, and then after I stepped down, and did a lot of work around consent. Consent Counts is, is one of their major platforms. Um, I am a rape survivor. Um, I was drugged and raped when I was in, in New York City and turned something that was really awful into something really positive. Mm. You know, so you talk about consent, you talk about intimidation, you talk about it. I'm 6'4 and I stand up and I'm like, what the fuck is your problem? Yeah. It's either, oh my god, or it's like, hi, daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the two options that, that you sort of get. Um, but they they do um, they do workshops, they do outreach, they um, have done emeritus briefs on you know, different types of things. Um, across all levels, you know, not just gay men, but, you know, lesbians, pansexual, straight, um, across all platforms, so to speak. Um, and I've done a lot of really good work. Um, the DSM-4, which is sort of a dictionary of um, um, what psychologists and therapists use to determine stuff. Um, BDSM was taken to a fetish, not a... Not an illness. Not an illness through a lot of work through this organization. It's contemporary, so and a lot of really great work. Are you still affiliated? Loosely, okay. you know. But um, let's see, it's one of the spin-offs of the Dirty Sports from Washington, D.C. Right? Hope I'm working for So, but I want to be remembered as someone who helped people raise their sexual.